Um, but good morning, and uh, we actually uh, kick off a, a morning session on uh, different uh, uh, different perspectives, different tools uh, of of um, and thinking of of colleagues regarding trust. Um, there's a lot of diff uh, a lot of um, discussion that we had already yesterday about it, but there's actually a a session on this, so I, I look forward to to our whole panel to speak. But I get the privilege to to be the first one uh, to give you a little bit uh, a, a little bit of of, of a context um, uh, on managing infodemics during outbreaks and other uh, acute health events. And I'll, and I think it's going to become apparent very soon why. Um, so infodemic management is a practice that has really as far as uh, definition um, and uh, different interventions and different approaches has really matured extremely rapidly the last, especially the last three, four years uh, since the start of the pandemic. And um, WHO, um, you see here WHO definitions uh, on it. Um, uh, I think a couple of pre uh, uh, speakers even refer to it. So an infodemic is an overabundance of information. And this includes accurate and inaccurate uh, health information that is spreading in digital and physical space. And it's accompanying uh, an acute health event like an epidemic or, or an emergency. Uh, the definition and a lot of the multidisciplinary approaches uh, are actually discussed in this open access book uh, that I co-edited together with two other uh, two other colleagues um, from WHO. We will actually uh, hear from Sylvie Bion, uh, Director of Pandemic Epidemic Preparedness uh, and Response Department uh, later today. Uh, but actually, one of the things that I wanted to mentioned before before I, I also discuss a little bit how this act, how this interacts with trust is um, the two pieces the infodemic and the context of an emergency so you you saw a version of this slide uh, about the digital information environment yesterday because the inf we cannot only be talking about misinformation when we're talking about misinformation we're actually missing most of the conversations and in, uh, that that are circulating in the information environment um, actually there's estimates that in most communities most environments uh, the share of mis and disinformation in the all of the all of the content that is circulating is between 5 and 25% so imagine that if we are over proportionally looking at um, at uh, reacting to misinformation, and there was some discussion yesterday. This is reactive, uh, uh, reactive, especially when it comes to to health and where the mandate of a health authority is. The health authority actually has a lot more uh, mandate, a lot more influence on the left side of this continuum. So. Uh, answering questions, answering concerns about about health, uh, and filling in the information void. So when people are are searching actively searching for information and not finding it, uh, all of this is really important because when questions, concerns, information voids are not addressed, they can uh, form and reinforce narratives that uh, then can uh, uh, latch on to mis uh, to to misinformation and, and disinformation mm -hmm. and can be exploited by disinformation uh, as well. I also get asked a lot about, well, but why did WHO define this in the context of emergency? Because, yes, you're right. I mean, the information environment, and I, I made this point yesterday, the information environment impacts all of the health system, all of the health programming, not only... Uh, uh, our, our our work in acute health events. But um, I would actually argue that if a health authority, if a Ministry of Health, health department at national, subnational, local level is unable to even respond effectively to the challenges of the information environment in an emergency, uh, there will be no capacity and we cannot expect that there will be an effective systematic uh, response also in routine. Um, so it's really, really important from the point of view of 
uh, emergency response and preparedness to really be looking at uh, at how do we effectively um, um, reinforce um, existing capacities, but also how do you think uh, through um, leveraging then the uh, cap uh, capacities, tools, the methods, the approaches that uh, one would use in order to respond to another major global event uh, like, we, well, like we lived through the last four years, um, and then, of course, some of the skill sets, some of the tools can definitely be used uh, in, um, uh, in, in other topics as well. Um, now, why is this important is because um, any time there's a shock to, uh, that occurs in, uh, so an acute health event occurs that introduces a shock where people... Um, actively need to protect themselves, actively are searching for health information. This is where we need to act, uh, we, uh, the information environment changes. Um, there's more engage people actively search more for information. They want to specifically know about a particular topic, how they protect themselves. There's a lot more communication going on from different parts of government. There's a lot more experts that are present in the media environment that are giving their opinion many more communities that normally don't think about health um, start thinking about that particular health topic. Health narratives and health topics penetrate to communities that normally don't think about health. And also fact checkers, journalists, etc. media covers it more. And that actually really changes the relationships within the information environment. But when you take a look, um, normally and most commonly, one would think about an acute health event as an outbreak, epidemic, and pandemic. And this is the, the core of also formulating the preparedness um, capacities around. But you would also think about it as an any other health emergency. Or, for example, something acute uh, would also be an occurrence of um, adverse event following immunization, immunization programs. Uh, know this quite a lot, but I wouldn't even argue that any big change in health programming where health guidance change, changes a lot or a new immunization is introduced, uh, an immunization program, that actually is an acute health event. It spurs a lot of um, um, uh, uh, confusion, uh, potential confusion, potential need for not only communicating, but basically all of the health system to responding um, uh, 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 to this. Now, this slide is something that I also showed yesterday, um, but the gist of what I would wanted to point out today is that ultimately where the information environment and health system interact is in the trust and acceptability and confidence in the health system, in the health workers, and in the like I said yesterday, like a very broad uh, of what I lump under health behaviors, which is trust and acceptability of public health um, and so, uh, social measures, or also therapeutics, diagnostics, uh, treatments, vaccines, uh, etc. And this part is very important in my view because misinformation and a chaotic information environment in health on health topics can erode people's trust in emergency responses when you need it the most, when you need the, uh, the communities to um, adhere to health guidance uh, uh, that, that the health authority is uh, introducing. And um, to, I think to colleagues, uh, to all of you that work in immunization, some version of this may not be that unfamiliar because um, I think we actually need to think about um, uh, communities um, and trust on a spectrum where there's high access to health services, high access to health information, and high trust in the health system, uh, health workers, and the uh, recommended health behaviors, that's where we will see people following the guidance and also showing consistent trust in these. But um, this is where the equity lens of thinking through um, uh, and the public health approach to, to working in this uh, space is uh, looking at the low access, low linkage to health system, low um, access to health information, current and relevant health information, uh, and low trust 
low trust uh, communities that historically have had low trust in uh, across all of these dimensions. Well, these are usually the communities that experience um, a lot of the practical social and economic variants to, fo uh, to follow the health guidance. And these are the most vulnerable. These are usually that, that, we, that we look at. But it's really important from the information environment point of view that I was describing yesterday to, act, to, to, to seriously also consider the health information equity uh, as, as part of this. So um, really the, uh, the effectiveness of infodemic management in emergencies will be limited by the level of preparatory work uh, that you've done in routine. And um, this is, uh, for example, um, I'll, I'll discuss a little bit of what potential strategies would be in, in, the, in the three uh, different uh, phases of, of the emergency management cycle. Um, linked to trust. Um, there's a lot of other references that at the end of my presentation, you can take a look uh, yourselves, but I tried to summarize it here a little bit. Um, so obviously before an emergency, this is a time when you develop and maintain trust and resilience in communities. And uh, remember if, if we're thinking about linkage to health system, um, access to health information uh, and trust building, then it's not a surprise that some of the trust building actions uh, before an emergency are specifically uh, supporting needs of vulnerable populations, which meaning increasing linkage and work with them, um, reinforcing the relationship between the healthcare provider and, and patient, we heard multiple times yesterday that healthcare providers are the most trusted source of health information overall across the board, globally, in, in, uh, across cultures. Um, and that we need to make concerted effort to increase linkage between health authorities and where people form communities. So uh, what we like to say is uh, where people work, pray, uh, pray play, study, and, and gather. Um, Another piece that's really important, so if you're thinking about, well, how do you then work with communities? I think actually the important part of working with communities is that you collaborate with communities in a way that they are reflected in the health policies and, uh, they, and they are partner to, partners in implementation. Uh, I mean, at the end of the day, during an emergency, it's the health authority that ends up recommending and setting what the health guidance is. But what um, we can do is that we collaborate in commu with communities beforehand so that uh, appropriate linkage and appropriate planning and appropriate prioritization uh, and relationships are built with those that are communities of focus, that are priority uh, partners, uh, et cetera, and that uh, that implementation and co-implementation, um, co uh, partnership in implementation is already set up as a relationship before an emergency occurs. Uh, the bottom two I alluded to yesterday as well. One of the most proactive things that we can do, and, and this is, I think, a long-term strategy, uh, is to promote digital information science and health literacies. Uh, it really, it's it's a it's a it's an important strategy for increasing resilience. Um, it, it's a it's a general strategy, but it's 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 extremely important. And lastly, what it's really uh, key, and we've been trying, we've seen a lot of this uh, efforts the last several years, is to really continuously build uh, on on what works. So learning from, from the experience and addressing what I call low level infodemics. It may not be uh, full large scale emergencies, but there may, may be flare ups, there may be outbreaks, et cetera, more localized. And it's actually really important to, um, to have that type of a routinized and systematic approach that becomes a habit uh, when it comes to, to response. Um, this uh, slide deck is going to be shared with you uh, from the point of view of immunization programs. I actually uh, collected a couple of uh, examples of uh, this um, strategies in preventing and preparing uh, in, in terms of um, 
infodemic management and uh, uh, and immunization. Now, obviously, during an emergency, the the diversity of actions uh, sort of gets reduced, and the interventions become a lot more focused uh, because there's only certain things that during an emergency when people's health information seeking sharing how they feel about health information that changes and there's only certain things that then really work very well but from the point of view of trust um, the first thing most important is to systematically and rapidly identify and address uh, people's questions, concerns, information, words, and narratives that are circulating. This is also the reason why I was presenting yesterday the infodemic insights as one of the um, uh, one of the ways that we can routinize this um, and stand up, uh, then scale up this in, a, in an emergency as necessary. Now, paired with that, is really important to then take timely action, timely and consistent action not only in words, so not only communicating our, uh, out of an emergency, but also in actions and interventions. So um, one of my favorite examples, from, actually from learning from immunization program history, is uh, the polio, uh, polio program, where um, over time, um, uh, they, uh, it has been adapted that um, uh, especially in communities, uh, the last mile communities that were experiencing and basically uh, receiving visits on a monthly basis uh, from people knocking on their doors, offering uh, oral drops um, for uh, oral polio drops, where uh, uh, actually trust of, of, of a very effect, uh, into a very effective immunization program in those communities started to erode because uh, seemed to work that, that vaccines can be shipped into the community like clockwork, um, every month, but the community was experiencing, experiencing a lot of other hardships and, uh, started basically mistrusting the, uh, the, um, health system for not actually addressing what their, their issues were and what their experience was. Uh, but we, uh, but the, the, uh, the polio, the polio vaccine was very important. So the polio program learned from this and uh, through the, um, uh, what is it, uh, Polio Plus, right? Um, started actually offering other services uh, to the communities uh, in addition. So this is actually not rocket science. Uh, it's something, it's actually social listening at its best because you actually translate what you're learning about the needs and concerns of the community and then providing the, the what they're expressing that uh, they're needing or um, making sure that that is addressed some other way. So consistent actions and interventions are just as important as communication uh, in order to 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 leverage the existing trust and then prevent erosion of, of, of the trust in the communities. One other thing that's really important is not to really leave health workers behind because during an emergency, um, we need to not only ac uh, account for what information they need they have and what kind of skills they need in order to, to do their job, but actually what are their experiences as well and make sure that we prevent health worker burnout and address some of the issues that come up uh, uh, during an emergency as well. Um, from the point of view of information environment, the, the points four, five, and six are more the infodemic management part. Maybe something that may not be uh, that, uh, that uh, familiar uh, to the strategies because I think the first three are something that are more, more, more common and more known. Um, the fourth one has to do a lot with uh, the understanding of how the information environment and ecosystem works. And I alluded to this a little bit yesterday. Um, uh, information doesn't flow uh, anymore um, through sort of like a top-down or uh, approach, um, a lot of the narratives get um, reinforced through even basic signaling of a meme or sometimes even asking somewhat seemingly questions that may be very, um, uh, they seem neutral, but they may be feeding into a narrative. So, um, 
once you identify what questions, concerns, and narratives are circulating, one of the best ways to to then address um, uh, a particular concern, health topic, or engage in a narrative is to work with structured, but what I also call unstructured networks. So during the pandemic, um, health workers online, digital natives, so those who are who grew up with digital media and have are more comfortable uh, interacting on different social channels, um, actually sprung up their own unstructured, no leader network and communities of, of health workers that basically were engaging with patients and with people's questions and, and concerns about vaccines or about uh, uh, COVID public health and social measures. And uh, this is just as powerful than thinking about, oh, we need someone that is an influencer, someone that is a more traditional, uh, traditional um, trusted messenger. Um, number five, I think, is really important. If you looked at the <clears throat> news uh, lately, um, for example, in the US and in the UK, but this is not only uh, limited to uh, 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 to, to those environments also in, in other countries. Um, ultimately, one of the challenges in information environment is also, is also that sometimes health guidance takes really long time to change and adapt. And, um, one of the, in my opinion, uh, good strategies and best strategies to make sure that the most current health information is available for people that need it, especially when it when it changes uh, and perhaps uh, addresses and discusses some uh, vulnerable, vulnerable priority groups, is to make sure that the health guidance gets updated. So if people are expressing that there's confusion, that they don't understand, that they don't see the health guidance being uh, that has been published uh, as applicable to them, that's where action needs to be taken. And these are some things that are within the health uh, authorities control to do so. Um, and lastly, um, so here's some examples uh, uh, of this. Um, these are, I, I really encourage that you actually click through because I don't have the time to think, uh, to discuss all of these projects, but working uh, um, in, um, with the information ecosystem in a, in a way that is also aware of how health information is searched for um, and accessed is, is uh, digitally is, is, is actually really, really important. Um, now, what happens after emergency? Well, we need to learn from the gaps in trust because inevitably we will experience that. We will be able to identify that and reinforce, reinforce resilience. So um, this is where a lot of the, the learning comes in, updating preparedness and response plans, uh, um, uh, learning from the experience of health workers, learning uh, experience uh, from the community. This is where, in my opinion, we need to be much better at using participatory evaluation methods to really bring out uh, the, the experience and understanding and the voices of, of different communities that, that we had worked with. Um, but then during emergencies, a lot of new partnerships spring up. Uh, we need to be much better. Uh, and and COVID-19, the pandemic, is one great example of it. What's, uh, uh, it's, it's really critical, in my view, to um, make sure that we institutionalize partnerships, new ways of working, new ways of whether it was accessing data, working with communities, um, doing faster, faster science to, to practice, um, whatever it was, we need to make sure that that gets institutionalized. That's a lot of times drops off, but when it comes to working with the information environment, because it's a societal problem, health, uh, health tends to then kind of drop off uh, after the emergency, for example, misinformation space has already moved on to elections and to climate and to hate speech. But actually, some of the things that, that I was mentioning earlier yesterday and today, I hope I convinced you, there's actually a lot of work for within the health space with health authorities and all of the partners to, to do so that the public health and health systems are actually able to respond to the challenges of, of uh of the information environment uh, going uh, forward. Um, this is uh, number five is something that's happening right now. Lots of discussion 
globally among policymakers, but I think every country is facing the same. How do you then integrate or pivot the capacity that you invested in for this large emergency response? How do you don't lose the people and the know-how and the experience and that you integrate that into routine programming, routine capacities? That's very key. We're not always great about it, but um, it's really important to also look at, well, how do you then uh, use that to to uh, promote organizational change and and uh, learning, uh, take the best of the experience and, and integrate it into uh, uh, in into other preparedness and other health priorities that the health system will say. And then, of course, um, learn from what didn't work. We don't often and enough talk about what didn't work um, for a variety of reasons, but I actually do think that that's really important. And then really ramp up then also research for the specific uh, sp specific things that did work. Um, one of the things in infodemic management, specifically the last three years, that I think uh, needs more is a lot of things have been tried. Sometimes spaghetti was thrown at the wall, but a lot of things did work. We just are not as great documenting and sharing the experience, um, which means that um, people that are more plugged in into the the global infodemic manager networks and that are coming to meetings like this to share experiences they they know about it but we need to actually really ramp up also uh, uh experience sharing uh, evaluation and communicating this to to the through the research and through uh through the sci science uh, and policy circles so last slide um really what it comes down to if you're thinking about trust building infodemic management capacities of the health system, it actually comes down to what I showed you this yesterday. Um, we need to routinize infodemic management process and capacities in a health authority. Uh, how this is done, um, health authorities across the world have done this differently in different formats. But the most important thing is, and someone mentioned yesterday, this is the typical public health process. Um, uh, diagnosing, understanding what the problem is, designing and intervening, evaluating, learning and adapting. Um, so uh, what is different here is that when you're working with the information ecosystem, and like I said, because the, the solutions are not only communications uh, specific, but specific to how the health program as a whole interacts, health system, health workers and the products um, how uh, how we, uh, the health system actually builds trust in them. Uh, that means that um, not only the information ecosystem part, but also other challenges and other functions within the health program needs to, to need to be more responsive to what uh, uh, people's concerns and questions uh, uh, and narrative circulating about this are. So I have. Thank you very much.